Um, I, I feel that most people who go into operations tend to pick up the technical skills more easily anyway. Like, it's just the, the type of person. So I don't think you need to come into revenue operations with that background to be successful. Welcome back to another episode of Go to Market Excellence. Uh, I'm Dan Quirk, and my guest today is Aja Corbett. She's head of revenue and community operations at Rev Genius. Rev Genius is a Rev Genius is a fifteen thousand person community for revenue professionals, uh, all the way from sales to marketing to CS to operations professionals. Previously to this. Asia was director of RevOps at Postal.io, and she has a background in business analysis and finance. We're lucky to have her on the show. Uh, let's give it up for Asia. Asia, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we were just talking right before I clicked the red record button about the different paths that people take before they land in RevOps. And I want to start with this because you actually said something that I think would surprise a lot of people. It surprised me. You said... You do not need technical skills to be successful in RevOps, in, in a RevOps role. So I want to hear why you believe that and uh, why you feel strongly about that. Yeah, so I and I want to clarify what I mean by technical skills. I mean like the literal administration of your tech stack, being a Salesforce certified admin. Um, the most important thing is to me is having a strong like project management skill set because that even feeds into how you manage Salesforce administration or how you manage tools um, because those are all mini projects. If you want to get them done, you have to be able to take the ideas or the requirements from stakeholders, put together a plan execute it and then like push it, push it out, push out the communication, all of that stuff, track everything. Mm -hmm. So that's probably like the number one, number one thing. Um, and then the second is like a strong process oriented mindset. Mm -hmm. So that's like, all right, when we, I'll use CRM as an example, because it's a very um, easy one for people to, to get. It's like, okay, we want to route our leads somewhere. Like, what's the process for that? And having, being able to say, okay, let's go to sales and marketing, figure out what we're trying to do. Like, what is our go-to-market motion? Um, where should the handoffs be? Literally document out that process, then put all the tools on top and then drop the people in place. Like, okay, we have our SDRs and then we have, or we have marketing doing the marketing programs and we have our SDRs and handoff to AEs and then CS. So thinking about it like that, and then you can learn the technical stuff. Mm. Um, I, I feel that most people who go into operations tend to pick up the technical skills more easily anyway. Like it's mm. just the, the type of person. So I don't think you need to come into revenue operations with that background to be successful. Yeah, and you, you mentioned process and um, and pr project management. We'll get to that in a second. I do want to ask you, though, from your perspective, you have a background in accounting and finance, um, as well as business analysis. W what about that? Uh, but but not so much on like Salesforce administration or marketing automation administration. So um, how was it for you when you came into your first role in RevOps and you made the transition from, you know, your past skills and skill sets into RevOps? And uh, tell us a little bit about your transition and um, and why why your background prepared you to be really good at RevOps. Yeah, so operations, rev ops, sales ops, marketing ops, this is a, there's a, a lot of moving pieces. It's very cross-functional. Um, so you have to be able to work with different people and communicate with them and keep updated and stay organized. So that's like one of the most important things in project management. Um, and, and so I did do a little bit of that too. But the analytical skills from coming from like a finance sort of um, background help for sure knowing how to use Excel and Google Sheets and how to run reports and understanding those things definitely helps um, but when I first started 
uh, on a business operations team, which is like the closest thing to a RevOps team, uh, I, my boss created a Salesforce trailhead module learning path for me. And she said, here you go, do these modules, um, learn about the company, meet everybody. And then that was a month, the first month that I started. After that, she started giving me these small projects. Uh, and uh, that's how I picked up those skills. Like I learned everything about the tech and tech, all of those things on the job, mm. but being able to like, uh, uh, well, Salesforce has a reporting interface, right? So being able to run reports in Salesforce and understand how to build that, to give to somebody to show them what they need, that comes from knowing the finance side of things. Um, and, and just to understand like how the business works, I did in, in my first, like first, very first internship, it was basically an accounting internship. I did a lot of like GL stuff, being in the GL, um, reconciling things. And my like schooling background wasn't in accounting. And I found that that's not what I wanted to do when it's something a little bit more fast paced interesting and working with people. So that's mm -hmm. how I kind of started going more towards operations. And then when I got into tech, it's like when I got into business operations, sales operations, revenue operations. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And certainly RevOps sits at the center of, uh, of, of modern businesses today. And so understanding balance sheets, P and L, how, um, yeah. how, what, how did that prepare you? Any specific stories about how, how that, um, those skills and that knowledge makes life easier for you today? Well, at Rev Genius, literally, we don't have a finance person, so all the forecasting is falling on me. Mm -hmm. And having an, having an understanding of how to do that and what it means and how to forecast revenue, for example, is helping me now, like literally at this moment. Um, understanding accounting concepts makes it so that I know we need to go hire someone to do accounting because we need to stay like gap compliant mm -hmm. and all of those things. So that, that definitely, um, helps me today, literally in my job right now. Um, and then I think it just helps give like a bit, like a big picture. It, it helps continue to build your big picture of like the business and how things work together and not just sales marketing and CS, but like, how does that all feed into the financials and like, how does that all feed into the forecasting and how can you tell like if we're going to be successful or not? Yeah. So let's switch gears a little bit and go into what I know is a personal passion of yours. And that is, um, processes, but not only that is being an evangelist for, um, for processes as kind of the key to success in revenue operations. And, and so, um, tell me why, why do you believe that process is the key to success and, um, what, what happens when that isn't, uh, it, when process isn't adhered to in your experience? Yeah. So process is really important because it's like literally how do you get from point A to point B? Like, what are we doing? That's, getting us from zero dollars to a million dollars. Like that's all of those things that get you there are processes. You've got like little micro processes and then the overall large process. And in your go to market, um, I try to think of things first as like, okay, the customer or buyer journey or Rev Genius members, like that person's journey, and then the business processes that support that, so that get them from A to B. So that's like could be um, lead routing, it and then handoffs from sale, marketing to sales to CS, implementation and onboarding. That's a process, um, and then renewals. All of those things. And it's kind of, it feeds into this circular motion. And so it keeps your revenue generating engine running. Mm -hmm. Without those processes, you kind of are flying blind and you don't know what, if you, what you're doing works or not. Or like you may have an idea. Um, but the process gives you uh, steps to follow. 
It gives you something to iterate off of and improve, and it can be flexible. I think a lot of people here probably like, oh, we have to do this process documentation or we have to define this process and think it's going to keep you like very rigid. And it's not. It's just meant to like keep you focused. Uh-huh. If that makes and, sense. And, and, and Rev and, Genius is yeah, go ahead. No, you tell me about Rev Genius. Go ahead. I was just going to say we're a small team. So we're in this like startup sort of yeah. mode where you'd think like, okay, moving really fast, trying to add in the process element and define these things is going to slow us down, but it's actually not. It's mm-hmm. helping us get organized. It's helping us figure out our go-to-market strategy. It's helping us in all of these different ways. And um, I'm really appreciative that Jared realizes that because it's important. <laughs> Even if it's not fun, like this is not the fun part of revenue operations, it, but it's a very critical part of the foundation. If you don't have a foundation, you can't have anything else. You spoke about go to market. Um, you, you're mostly referring to go to market processes. You said um, there's always a journey, mm-hmm. right? That a that a yeah. prospect or a new member or um, somebody goes down. Bef- first, they hear about your company and somehow engage with yeah. you guys, and then they go through some level of a process. And uh, hopefully, it's not sloppy, and hopefully, it's like really sharp, like you want it to be. But um, w- yeah. w- what would somebody who who isn't doesn't really have tight processes right now. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of RevOps mm-hmm. people fall into the category of uh, one person shops or one man shop, one woman yeah. shop, whatever you want to say. And so they're yeah. overwhelmed and there's a lot of pro- broken processes that lead to uh, data corruption. So what's the best way to get yep. started in maybe mapping those processes and those, those journeys that you refer to? Yeah, totally. And I can relate because I was a one person shop. I still am. Um, and I've been previously on a small team. So mm-hmm. the business operations team where I was um, before was a two-person team at one time, and then we were a three-person team, so very small and lean. And I know it is overwhelming. It was overwhelming to me, too. I'm like, where do I start? Uh, and so what I did is I kind of segmented my um, stakeholder groups, so sales, marketing, CS, product, and finance, and... Um, did sort of like an inventory or a catalog of the processes, the operational processes that support those functions. So like on the sales side, there'd be um, uh, handoffs, um, the sales process, sales cycle, um, deal desk, um, uh, activity tracking, like so SDR activity tracking, reporting, um, and I did that for marketing and CS too. And CS at Postal, where I was before, was so new um, and young that there were literally none, no, mm. no, no processes at all, no implementation process, nothing like defined, solid implementation process, onboarding, customer onboarding, and then renewals. Um, so when I was thinking of, all right, how do I now manage my work to these, I guess? Yeah. Uh, I try to think of it as like a continuum, not okay. Sales. Okay. Marketing. Okay. CS more like here's the whole journey from lead to customer. What does the business process, like what does that smooth sort of line look like? They click on the, they click on something, request a demo, then they enter into the sales process, then they're in the their opportunity stages, then they close, then they go to onboarding, then they go to renewal. So that's how I try to think about it because I found like segmenting too much um, took away from like the rev ops Absolutely. feel to, to it. Um, and so if you're finding yourself overwhelmed, literally get a Google sheet or like your notebook and write like, right? Um, so like se- break them out, re- catalog the processes, think about what your, like what your customer journey looks like, your buyer to customer journey, and see where those processes line up. And then you start meeting with stakeholders to figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's super important what you just went through. And I think that's a foundational piece of building a, a process and a data model. Uh, you're mostly f- 
talking about processes there and uh, the different pathways people could go down. So th the first thing somebody does, open a Google Sheet, um, map out all the processes, or maybe even a Lucid chart if you uh, have a Lucid chart account. Yeah. That would be another good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And um, a process map. Build a process map. And yep. at every point in the process, there are um, metadata points, right? And um, mm -hmm. so what the next step after you map all the processes, uh, how do you connect that to, okay, we have these processes, this is the data we need to measure the processes, and now let me go configure the technology to be able to capture all those micro data points, really. Um, is, is that the next step for you? And, and, if, and if so, tell me about that. If not, what's, what is the next step for you? Yeah, it depends on if you have you're, if you're walking into somewhere where your tech stack is configured already. Mm -hmm. I did at um, Postal. Uh, but when you do this, uh, when you go through this like process audit exercise, and then you start to figure out, well, what kind of questions do we need to answer? And then you say, okay, what are the systems that we're using right now? Where are we gathering data? How are the systems connected? Um, because what happens frequently or what can happen is the implementation of this tech stack it may not have been designed with those processes in mind and knowing the data that you want to gather and what you want to measure and what you want to report on and the questions you want to answer. So then you find yourself with this tech stack that's like, all right, great, everything I'm using, people are using their different systems, things are connected in a sense, but you can't report on anything because the mm. data is like siloed in all these different places and the tools that you've chosen don't work well together. So you can't push them all into one place. So you have to do a lot of extra work to get answers to questions with the data that you already have. But it's just like it's in very different places. So your reporting was really manual. So that is really why processes are important and why you should go with the process first like, forget the tech stack, forget the tools, think about what your your entire go-to-market process is first, and, and what are you trying to achieve, what questions you want to answer, what kind of data do you need to answer those questions, then choose your tools after that. Like, fit the tools to that and not the other way around. Did that answer your question? Uh, perfectly. Um... But how do you think if someone, um, someone in a RevOps role, how could somebody who's trying to do that get it wrong? Like, have you seen missteps in there? And have you made them yourself? Anything you could tell people to look out for when they're going through that process yeah. of data modeling? Yeah. Um, so I'd say try to get as much feedback from each stakeholder as possible so that they're involved in getting and having answers. Uh, they're, they're involved in this is the data that I need. These are the questions that I need answered mm -hmm. because otherwise, okay, so we did this project where we wanted to have better reporting and more visibility into our whole entire funnel at previous company. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were working with a outside consulting agencies. So they did an audit of our um, data schema and um all of the data that is, existed in our product, pushing it into um, segment and then pushing it into a downstream system so that we could report on things there. Um, but we didn't have a marketing leader to say hey, at that time while we were doing the project or that she came in later to say, hey, well, I actually need to know these things. I actually need to know like metrics A, B, C, and D because she wasn't there. We didn't capture that in requirements. Mm -hmm. And so we came to the end of this like consulting thing engagement and we didn't really like the value that we could have gotten out of that exercise of like redefining our entire data schema and reconfiguring our tech stack to push data into this end tool to have all of our reporting done there. Yeah. So everyone could go in and see from top of funnel to bottom what they needed to see it didn't end up working out like that. And so we didn't even use, like they pushed some data to that system that we were, weren't even reporting out of there because it wasn't pushing the data that we needed. Um, and so if keep all of the stakeholders 
in your Go to Market teams involved in this exercise so that as you're designing the, the integrations, your data model, where everything is flowing, you make sure you capture what they need mm -hmm. uh, because those are really tough projects to go back and redo. Yeah, they're massive projects. And what happens if you build something that everyone agrees upon and then they come back and they're like, oh, no, 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 now I want to do it this way. Um, I think that in, yeah. uh, in maybe in the on the software development, the product side, the way yeah. they think is, okay, well, if we make this change, what are the downstream effects? If we make this change, exactly. um, what's going to yep. break? But oftentimes sales and marketing people, and I, I'm one of them, so I can speak for myself, I want to just run a campaign and not so much worry about yeah. um, all the downstream effects or the side effects. But I think RevOps is starting to realize that that's kind of their yeah. role. And, and yes. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, totally. Um, that's a great point. So all you, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Marketing often or sales or any of those um, teams are often like, okay, I need to run a campaign or I need to do some sort of experiment and I need to um, have all of this data from HubSpot going to Salesforce, for, for example. But not understanding that the integration between HubSpot and Salesforce is not ideal um, for f many reasons. And then knowing that uh, how our tech stack is configured, like I'm speaking to a previous one, not the current one we're yeah. using, but Salesforce being the source of truth, but having two systems bi-directionally syncing to it. If you do something in one system, it's going to impact not only Salesforce, but the other system. So, or having people with system admin access, which is something you'll see in a lot of uh, threads and people's uh, posts talking about, no, this is why it's not to restrict people from doing anything or doing their jobs. It's literally because when you don't have a full picture of how all of these things, how all of the data is flowing and how all of the systems are updating each other, you could cause some pretty like catastrophic things to happen. Um, so I, uh, I created a data governance framework because oh, okay. I needed to now that I hit, I started, I kept hitting these, these issues. Um, but it saved me. It saved my butt once because I synced G2 I was syncing G2 out to Outreach yeah. and Outreach synced to Salesforce. Outreach, the way that they label their custom fields, and this is like such a small thing, but uh, the way they label their custom fields, once you overwrite their default label, you see it and it's just like, instead of custom field 11, it says uh, uh, lead score. Uh -huh. In G2 on the back end, it doesn't have the Outreach lab, uh, the outreach. Um, label that you put it has the default label which is like field one two three whatever yeah so mapping g2 fields to outreach i go into my um data dictionary and which I, is just a google sheet of all the field mappings so in for the outreach ones it says custom field one is a marketing channel custom field two is the lead source lead score or whatever um so i'm mapping these fields I go into my uh, Google Sheet, I almost overwrote other fields in Outreach because somebody made some changes, didn't update, update the d data dictionary, and so I almost overwrote with G2 field mappings. But because I had a data dictionary, I was able to see like, oh, custom field three is this, and I need to map the G2 field in a blank, empty field. Quick side note, G2 is not... No one's ever accused that of being the easiest tool to integrate with, by the way. No, it's yeah. not. And there's yeah. no, like, nobody knows how to do, like, on the outreach end, they're like, you have to go to G2. I'm like, can you help with this? Data's yeah. not showing up. And they're like, uh, I don't know why that would be. And it's just, uh. so yeah. we were trying to automate um, sequences for the sales reps to take action on buyer intent signals. And the, for me, I'm like the most direct way to do it is to go through outreach rather than having custom fields in Salesforce, having G2 right to those, then pushing that and mapping that to outreach, go the other way because mm -hmm. we want the sequences to come out of outreach. Yeah. So it's like, so me knowing that, like that's the most efficient way to do this integration. 
helps <clears throat> rather than someone saying, okay, like I know how to use Salesforce enough. Let me do this and um, maybe not create the best uh, using best practices with, with system setup. Yeah, I got you. Did I go on a tangent? <laughs> no, no, it was good. Do you need to get a drink of water? Okay. Drink of water? <laughs> you want to pause no, for a second? No, I am. Um, good? Okay. No, no. It's uh, my, it's, I'm congested up here because I think there's uh, a lot of pollen in the air. So, oh, yeah. But I'm good. Okay. Hang on two seconds. No worries. No, that, that was a great thing. Um, okay, so let's do, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a quick marker here, 25, 10. You mentioned earlier, Asia, you mentioned a uh, data governance playbook. Can you... Mm -hmm. open that playbook and tell us a little bit about what's inside and, and uh, what, what yeah. every RevOps leader should have inside their playbook. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I decided, I mean, it was on my roadmap. So when I, when I started, I created this roadmap and I told myself like, okay, the roadmap is supposed to be flexible. It's not set in stone, but I wanted to sort of plan out for the year or have an idea of over the year what the big RevOps projects should be. Um, data governance was on that list and uh, it was deprioritized. It was like, I don't think it should be de deprioritized, but okay. Um, and so we, we hit a massive like data I issue where HubSpot gives you a sync, uh, a sync us lo error log so you can go into hubspot in your integrations and kind of check and monitor if things are syncing correctly if things do not sync um, if there are sync errors they don't push back into salesforce like the the records just don't write back um and because i didn't have a data governance framework in place like that wasn't top of mind to me to like check that and mm -hmm. make sure like really really make sure there's no sync errors uh so and because the data governance framework project was deprioritized, I was like, okay, I'll just, do, I'll handle it later. I'll do it later. Yeah. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. So uh, one day I <clears throat> like went into the sync errors. I don't remember what I did, but I like fixed something. And apparently there were like a thousand records, new ones. That didn't get synced to Salesforce because there was some sync error. Amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so my boss was like, are these people, are these qualified, are these MQLs that haven't been followed up with? A thousand of them? And I was like, oh my God, I started sweating. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? Why did this happen? And I was like, um let me find that <laughs> let me find that out uh and so like we we looked back and he's like well why did this happen i'm like oh my god why did this happen so i figured it out i was like okay well the sync errors cause these records not to sync back because there were some sync errors i don't know it could be like something as simple as salesforce has uh if you're going to write something, if you're going to push a record, map a field that's a pick list, it's got to be the exact same values. Like, mm -hmm. otherwise, there's one value off, it's not going to sync. Yeah. Um, and so I was explaining this to him, and he's like, oh, okay, I guess. Um, and a lot of those leads were old, like really, like six months plus old, and they were, a lot of them were junk. So it was, it ended up like not, like it was really shitty to have happened. But they weren't MQLs. Yeah. So I was like, they weren't hot demo requests. <laughs> because, yeah, it will, cause so you can imagine if there was even like 50 demo requests in there, that's revenue that's potentially lost. Oh, yeah. So it's a very impactful Hugely, yeah. thing. Uh, right. I have, so I was like, and you're hey. not alone. I've done the same thing before. I, I ran a. Right. Face, oh, remember, my gosh. You know, Facebook lead ads. You set up Facebook lead ads, you connect it to HubSpot. Yeah. Um, yep. But I. I had yep. forgotten to add like a couple of new lead ad campaigns that were run. So the workflow was running in HubSpot, Ooh. but it wasn't capturing all the leads. And so um, they weren't getting yeah. sent over to Salesforce. And I mean, yeah. it, it happened only for like a week, but we were getting so many leads from Facebook. There was probably like um, 500 or so leads, I think, which is a lot yeah. of money, you know, like 
Yeah, it is. It's it's like if you put it in terms of in terms of revenue. So it's like, hey, look at luckily, boss, these thousand leads were pretty much junk. But what if 50 of them were demo requests? This is why it's important to have a data governance framework. What would be in that data governance framework is a regular system audit. Mm -hmm. Um, making sure that there's a piece of the day or the week that is dedicated to um, system health, like integration health, integrations between your core systems, like your marketing automation, your CRM, and your sales engagement tool, uh, like outreach is what we use. So like those three things, it's very important to make sure that the sync and the integration is running well and there are no sync errors. Uh, so that's part of the data governance framework. Another is the data dictionary that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. It's it's to make sure that the, the whole purpose of the data governance framework playbook is to ensure that your system and data integrity so you can make informed data-driven decisions and people trust the data. Yeah. Like that's like the whole purpose. And so there's those components that I came up with, one of like that audit I created a system automation catalog <clears throat> because luckily the tech stack was like young enough that there wasn't a, a bunch of legacy automation uh, where you have to track all of these changes of like, okay, there's 20 workflow rules on a contact and then there it, um, Salesforce lingo, there's 20 workflow rules on, on a contact and like 20 on a lead and 15 on an opportunity. But then you also have process builder and you also have flow and then you have HubSpot workflows, and then you have outreach triggers, right? So having a list of all of those things so that you know what they're doing and how they're pushing data to other systems, that helped me so I could say, oh, I know this. If someone's like, something may be wrong, like, okay, I would open that up and look at it, and I'm like, okay, there's like 50, it could be like one of these 15 things, or it's actually working as it's intended to, and maybe we need to like train people so they understand this is like was des- the system was designed this way do we need to make changes um, and then the data dictionary which saved my butt with like overwriting those field mappings um, and then one thing that I got from Manny Ortega at Redis Labs I was picking his brain he's the senior director of sales ops I think he has this concept of what's called a minimum viable record and it's basically for like, I took it for the most you most created records in the CRM, like leads, contacts, counts, opportunities, quotes. There's a minimum amount of information that you need before yeah. you can create it. Uh-huh. So you don't get junk in, in the system. And when your systems are integrated, especially pushing that junk to other places, who has to clean it up? Usually the ops person. And mm-hmm. if you're a team of one, that's takes a lot of your bandwidth. Um, so that was a hugely, uh, I, I think people saw the value of it later. Um, Cause again, that's not fun to like sit down and open a Google sheet and literally write down all the automation that you have in your systems, but it's necessary for that, for that reason. So your and data you governance did, uh, playbook is built in Google docs or sheets or some combination both a Google yeah. Docs and then like the automation catalog and uh-huh. the data dictionary were Google yeah. Sheets. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. You know, the other thing, and maybe you do this already, but um, uh, our, my co-founder Vinny, he always is, uh, anytime we work with new clients, he always installs a, a two dashboards in Salesforce. One's a daily data check dashboard and it just like, it flags any uh, records that seem like that that aren't they don't have like minimum viable record that aren't wouldn't qualify as minimum yeah. viable records. So some for some reason they missed a, yeah. a data point or some integration broke and so data is not flowing. So it like yep. catches it in real time, mm-hmm. almost real time. And then the other one is the clean your room dashboard. Maybe you've used this. Some people yes. call it like a, a sh- like um I don't know what the other name. I think there's another name for wall of shame maybe. Um, but anyway, the clean yes. room is for salespeople because there are so many they leave opportunities um, that have expired closed dates and things like that. So yep. many things like yep. that can be caught on dashboards like that. So, um, yeah, maybe yeah. are those things that you implement as well? I, uh, for myself, yeah, I had a, like a revenue operations health 
check dashboard. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a few of those things, uh, the incomplete records, mm -hmm. system generated records versus uh, like integration generated records versus uh, person. Like, so did this record get created through the HubSpot integration or did someone create it? Like, did they yeah. create this lead or was it the integration? Um, and a few other things for, for revenue operations, <clears throat> the clean your room dashboards, uh, those are tricky because you need, uh, buy-in from the team to actually like say, Hey, get, get like this dashboard, go clean your, your records. Yeah. yeah. And you need buy-in from the team and the leadership for them to actually do it. Otherwise it's like you do it and then. Nobody cares. Yeah. Well, there Nobody, has to be. Yeah. A, there has like, to be a leader that's that's uh, forcing the uh, adherence. Yeah. Yeah. You can only do so much as an operations person. You can put a lot of like guardrails in place. You can do some automation to an extent, but like you can't eliminate entirely. There's like a small percentage of of admin work, if you will that you have, you just have to do. And I think it's in every role too, by the way, like I still have to do it. Yeah. Um, Jared does it. He's a CEO, even though we're a small team, the backup postal, even at larger companies, like there's always that, that small amount. You just can't get rid of it and that's okay. <laughs> but you need the team to like have someone who's bought into like, Hey, this is why you have to actually do this because it's going to help you. It's going to help us help everybody to win win this is a perfect segue into the last thing i wanted to chat about and that is um <clears throat> how you've mm -hmm. uh different change management techniques that you've employed that have that have worked um because that's exactly what you're talking about right now you're talking about getting people to take action or move from off their current opinion to a new opinion or adopt some change that you make and um, what have you found yeah. is are the most effective ways? And why don't we just start with salespeople? Uh, because they're the ones yes. that are often the most common um, users putting data into the systems. Yeah. So I think the number one thing is that you have to try to meet people where they're at first, like understand where they're coming from. Excuse me. Um, my thing was to polls sort of informally poll the team and ask them like where what what are you doing right now that's working and what are you not doing or what is not working what could be better where are mm -hmm. you finding pain points and then so that informs the changes you need to make and then so when you start making changes you have to over communicate basically and i would go to slack i would go to people individually and then at the sales team meetings on fridays like hey remember this change this is why it's important or sales kickoff week um to one of them was using g2 with buyer intent um our our vp of alliances and partnerships was like this is important we should use it we have the tool we're getting this data like we should have the sales team like let's help them use it i said okay great so i created some documentation around it uh so i felt like told everyone okay here this is available in slack Hey guys, this report's available. Here's how you use this report. Okay, great. Next time. Hey, here's this documentation. It has screenshots. It has a little table with definitions. So if you forget, like this is how you use this G2 buyer intent. It was uh, uh, communicated at sales week. So literally in a presentation, same thing, screenshots. Here's why it's going to help you. Here's why... You should use it. Here's how it's going to boost your pipeline. Mm -hmm. Here's how you can like see people who might be slipping or like who are looking at competitors. So you can, knowing this, you can go into a call and say, Hey, whatever sales, um, uh, uh, objection, no, not objection and handling, uh, competitor battle cards, like all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you, you can use this to help your messaging to increase the likelihood that you'll close the deal. Uh, and then lots of reminding, uh, reminding. So the most important thing with change management is you have to just like over communicate and you have to hit, like hit from all, all avenues, Slack, email, meetings, um, a, tr a dedicated training 
Mm-hmm. And then people eventually, like, it depends on what the change is. Some people are more open to certain changes than others. The buyer intent change, like, going into Salesforce, saying, hey, this is, a, it lives in where your, your day-to-day is, rather than looking at a Google Sheet, because we have to change from this Google Sheet dump to the Salesforce report, and it's just making sure people do that by by reminding them. Yeah. Um, so I found that over communicating rather than just like the one time, hey, this is the change we're making. This is why. And that's it. Uh, people will forget. So repetition, you say repetition is a key. Yeah, different it, channels. Hit, hit people in different yep. channels. Um, yep. Use... Uh, make it personal to them and their how it's going to help them yep. be better and make more money yep. and, um, yep. and use visuals. I, visuals I are, that was something yeah, you said previously, are yeah. super important. Yeah. 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 Yep. And, um, so have you, uh, do you have any st- stories about, uh, like, uh, any change management wins that come to mind? Yeah. So I wanted to use this tool called guru have you heard of guru uh that's new to me it's no, um it's like a knowledge base or a wiki it's called get guru get guru is the um url yeah get just guru. found it yeah yeah so i um what so first i roll uh, pulled the team like are you having trouble finding information uh, to like to help you on your calls, like, oh, it's like sales collateral, it's like SharePoint, like, kind of like a SharePoint, but yeah, for, for companies yeah, that yeah, use yeah. modern tools, yeah, exactly. It yeah. is so easy to use the interface, managing it as like an admin, putting in content, so easy on the user end. Oh my gosh, download the Chrome extension and you are all set. So, knowing this, I'm like, okay, because. Trying to get people to use new technology or new tools is like one of the hardest things yeah, ever. Yeah. So so knowing that the, knowing what their pain point was, I'm like, okay, this is this solution will help them. So then the next thing is showing them it. Like, hey, look at this tool. Walking walk through the tool at very high level and show them. And I'm like, okay, great. Are you guys bought into this? Yeah, we would love to use this. Next part is um, the communication. Okay. It's up and running, um, and I would imagine a lot of organizations are Slack heavy, so you can put into a group, um, in a channel. Mm-hmm. Hey, this is up and running. Um, <clears throat> go log in. You've been invited to the space. Make sure that it's up and running, and then on the next like uh, next meeting that we have together, we'll walk through how to use it. And so then you walk through how to use it. So it's like a training, a uh, live training. Um, and then you follow up with written communication again, and then you just you just keep your money in. So they loved Guru, number one, I think because it was so easy to yeah. use, but also because I'm like, this is how it's going to help you. This is how it's going to help you. Um, and it's really easy to use. And I understand that it's hard to ch- make a change. Like, it's hard to change something you're doing. Um so yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. So I'm get huge, guru is the, guru. is the takeaway. They are too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I did want to ask you about, so you recently, oh, when this recording goes live, it will not be as recent as this today, but you recently, um, started yeah. at Rev Genius and yeah. you are, um, yeah. So for people who don't know about Rev Genius or if you don't know, um, anything other than the Slack group, Rev Genius, the Slack community. What is your, what's the vision? Um, obviously you guys have some big plans. So do you have any that you'd like to share? Yeah. So I went to Rev Genius as Rev Genius's mission aligns with like my core values as a person, empowering and inspiring and educating people, helping them learn and grow. So, uh, I really wanted to be a part of that. What Jared, Jared was building is building, we're building. Yeah. Um, and, so the idea is that we have a space for community-led learning and growth. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I can say too much about what we're building yet. 
but it's going to be really special. It's going to be really cool. I'm so happy to be on this journey with them. I, and I was in the community before I started working here full time. Like yeah. the, the communities, having a place to go and like be with peers because there's a RevOps, like there's a RevOps group within RevGenius. But just in general, like sales and marketing people I work closely with, the CS people. So being able to come to this space, ask people questions, chat with people, network, whatever, um, is is really really amazing and uh of course we have our our sponsors we have some really amazing sponsors and they do these webinars and events um and so those are something to look forward to as well like Rev genius puts out a list and you can also go on the website and see what's coming up and submit ideas for webinars and events so that's uh-huh. something that's still going to continue uh but the idea is Community-led learning um, is where where the future is. Yeah, and how and what kind of what's that going to replace? Is it going to replace a gap in, in learning today, or is it going to replace um, a uh, less um, less effective way of of learning that people are currently experiencing? Um, I think there's a gap right now because if you think about some of the other communities that are out there, like. And I'm a part of some of them. Like Sales Hacker is great, but they're very content focused, the community is. Um, And so there's a lot of content in there uh, to read and it's great. And I learned some from there Um, and I think people do too. And then there's like Modern Sales Pros and then there's Revenue Collective, which is now a pavilion, but they are exclusive and you have to pay to get in there and apply and so it puts barriers up to learning mm-hmm. and information and people and access to people so there is that that gap there i think that we're gonna sort of be in between the sales hacker and pavilion yeah wow very exciting we'll we'll keep an eye out for the uh the releases that are coming soon and um yeah. yeah best wishes in uh growing rev genius sounds like you guys have a great team over there and certainly got stronger when you joined um thanks for sharing i know your your mission is to uh to help and and sh- spread knowledge to other people and you certainly did that today so thanks so much for joining the podcast and um we'll be in touch thanks so much asia 